Hi, this is part two of the genome informatics uh, segment that I've been putting together for the Stellenbosch University uh, bioinformatics module. So I'm really hope, I really hope that uh, you've had a recent chance to look at the genome sequencing, mapping, and assembly lecture that should come directly before this one. The whole point of that exercise was to get us from a whole bunch of short patches of DNA sequencing reads into contigs and maybe even uh, a whole genome assembly of, uh, of, a, of a chromosome or of a whole organism's uh, DNA. Today we're going to talk about how we get from a, a huge DNA sequence to an annotated land map that says this area is a protein coding gene, this is a gene of this type, that sort of thing. So where yesterday we talked about uh, the, the processes of, of mapping and assembly. Today we're starting with this idea that we have a long piece of DNA and now we want to annotate it. We want to annotate a genome and we're going to do that uh, in large part through the use of sequence alignment. So today we're going to cover those topics. I would start by noting that we're going to talk about a rather complex bit of informatics called a hidden Markov model that is very, very useful for us to perform gene finding. In other words, given a long piece of DNA, say, that's gene, that's a gene, that's a gene. We do that with hidden Markov models. We're going to discuss how we go about uh, using those models. I would also note that today we have the benefit of, of, of very high throughput RNA sequencing experiments that gives us the ability to experimentally confirm what these hidden Markov models have to suggest about where genes may be found in a long sequence. Sequence alignment algorithms are a huge topic in the space of bioinformatics. We find that uh, many universities offer a semester-long class in just sequence alignment algorithms. Today we're going to give them relatively short shrift, but we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the very high value that we have in substitution matrices like Blossom 62 for scoring uh, the results of sequence alignments. Um, in the end, we're going to suggest that being able to match a known sequence to a novel sequence, like a, a, bit, a, a bit that's been assembled out of DNA sequencer reads, suggests shared motifs that suggest shared domains, and those shared domains imply shared function. So given that something looks like a protein coding gene, we can frequently discover that it has sequence, sequence homology to other known proteins that have known function. So that's, this is the, uh, the, the rationale that we're working from. Things that take on a similar sequence are likely to take on similar folds to make similar domains, and these similar domains in turn have, have shared function. So let's start by saying that um, although we may emphasize protein coding genes, there are more genes in a genome than just the protein coding ones. So at the left, I'm showing a tRNA, a transfer RNA. Um, it's a kind of an unusual sequence, and I want to note that if you're trying to see details in this video, you're probably going to be frustrated. So I would note that the description appearing below this video shows you where you can download the PDF of these slides so that you can look at them side by side. That will probably help a lot more. So uh, this is a tRNA. We see that it's one strand of RNA sequence that's that has a whole lot of places where the same sequence appears in complementary form. So the start of the sequence is complementary to a region of sequence at the end of the sequence. So this G and that C can base pair. This C and that G can base pair, and so on. This creates something that we frequently refer to as a stem loop formation. So we have these stems representing regions of sequence complementarity, that are separated by loops. So we have a tetra loop here that represents one RNA molecule that's folding into four stem loops, or one tetra loop. So naturally, the structure for this is relatively simple. Rather than start with DNA, build a messenger RNA from a pre-mRNA, and then go through the process of translation is a relatively complex set of steps. That's what we describe over here at the right. But at the left, we need to create a, a gene, in this case a tRNA gene in DNA, that produces this messenger, or this tRNA product that then self-folds to create that structure. 
the nature of a protein coding gene is quite a lot more complex than that. So we start with the fact that we have these transcriptional regulators that appear, at, in some cases, quite some distance away from the site of the gene itself. We have promoters. We have a, a transcription start site here. We have regions above and below the protein coding gene that are the, uh, the untranslated regions, the UTRs. We have exons, and in between them we have these introns. This is a, a eukaryotic gene. So in a case like this, we have a whole bunch of different elements that are all taking place in a particular series for this gene, and from it we'll be able to create a primary RNA that is then spliced to create various messenger RNAs. This is a, a, a large structure, and being able to recognize that all these different islands of DNA stuck, stuck together comprise one gene is quite a complex task. So the hidden Markov model is our answer for discerning where in a long sequence protein coding genes may be found. Hidden Markov models are not an easy thing to explain. When, when I gave my first lectures on this topic many years ago, I, I always cringed at the idea that I, I was going to have to be the person to introduce these to people. But after a little time, I hope I have some, some ideas that will make this concept easy to get across. Let's start with the fact that when we when we try to state a biological property attributed to some sequence, we frequently have a multi-part uh, assessment of what that is. In this case, we are looking at something for transmembrane hidden Markov model, for the TMHMM, designed to find proteins that go through the, the membrane in a transmembrane domain. So, we know in in, uh, from a biological point of view, this sequence is going to have to start on one side of the membrane, pass through it, circle around a bit on the other side, and then pass back through. So we have this transmembrane and uh, an over and back uh, relationship in this case. So we have this idea that inside the cell, on the cytoplasmic side, there's likely some part of the protein that forms a bit of a blob in there. On the outside of the, of the membrane, we have the possibility of, um, of more globular domains that are not really associated with the membrane itself. But every time we pass through the, uh, pass through the membrane, we've got to pass from this part that's all gobbled up into a globular domain. We have a loop that connects that blob to the part that passes through the membrane. That that loop gives it some flexibility to allow us to then pass through the membrane. So we have a cap that reflects this region uh, at the boundary of cytoplasm and membrane that's going to uh, represent this link uh, into the membrane itself. We have a helix core, and then we have another cap on the non-cytoplasmic side, the outside of the cell, basically. Um, and we can then pass through another loop into a, a globular domain. So we have this this relatively um, complex structure that's possible. The, the protein is going to have some parts very specific to the, uh, the passage through the, the side of, uh, through the membrane, and we're going to have other parts that are unrelated to it. This type of model can then be, uh, can then be can, uh, turned into an algorithmic portrayal of the different parts of this, that we have this part of the sequence that is attributable to a globular domain, we have this part of the sequence that's attributable to a helix core, and we have these other bits that link from one to the other. Now, when we create a hidden Markov model, we need to be able to relate a model of what's going on biologically to the sequences that are perceived from this. So I, I note that from a biological point of view, we have, uh, we're, we're making an assessment. This is a protein coding gene, for example. And that assessment is, is not just one piece. It's lots of different pieces. This is an intron. That is an exon, for example. So these represent different states within a model. And generally speaking, we're going to have some model that starts somewhere, a state zero, that then passes through other states and finally gets to some terminal state. So state zero is where we start, state four is where we end in this case. But it's important to remember this is called a hidden Markov model, which is to say that the sequence doesn't come with labels. The sequence is just a sequence. 
we need to we need to match various states of our model to various parts of the sequence that we can see. So the identity, the, the true biological meaning of this sequence is hidden from us, the hidden model, and the, the model is going to have some sort of way that it is perceived through the sequences that relate to it. So you might be moving from one state to another within the biological model of what the sequence does, but these different states are in turn going to have some sort of way that they are perceived in the sequence. Let's consider the case of a promoter. A promoter is very frequently associated with sequences that are, uh, that, that are called tata boxes for a reason. They have a lot of T and A nucleotides that comprise them. So uh, if you see a sequence that's like T A T A T A T T T A A T A T A T A, that's likely to be a promoter region. So in this case, the nature of it biologically is just some state within our model. But it also has some, uh, some extent to which it is perceived because the output probabilities, the emission probabilities for each of these states, relates to what sequences you're most likely to see if you happen to be in that state. So if you are in intergenic region, it, it might be that uh, a, C, G, and T have very equal probabilities of being emitted to the sequence. But when you look at the sequence that is emitted by a promoter, it's very, very much more likely that it will output T and A letters than it will output C's and G's. So what we have then is some series of transitions that allow us to move uh, from one state in our model to another, these are the, the T values that we see here. So uh, a T, uh, uh, a transition probability of 0.8 suggests that it's much more likely we move from state 0 to state 1A than to state 1B. This is a, a, a lopsided model where going to state 1A is much more likely. These transition probabilities um, are one of the features that tell us how we traverse through the biological model, but the emission probabilities tell us what kinds of sequences are likely to be perceived for each of these boxes. So I would note that in this model, we have one biological model here, shown in red, but we have two different sequences that come from it. The blue sequence starts with uh, a letter observed for state 0, and then a letter observed for state 1a, a letter observed for state 2, a letter observed for state 3b, and then a letter observed for state 4, and that's the end of it. This is five letters that came from one traversal through the model. But at the right, we see that a model of six letters has come from the same model. How did that come about? Letter 1 corresponds to state 0. Letter 2 corresponds to a traversal to state 1b instead. You see that it took this path rather than that one through the model. Letter 3 comes about at state 2, but did you notice this little arrow on the side of state 2? It allows state 2 to be followed by state 2. And so in this case, a loop where state 2 was followed by state 2 led to a second letter being output for that single state because we looped around. So one traversal through the biological feature may yield not just different sequences, but sequences of different lengths as well, depending on which forks you take and whether any cycles took place, a, a loop of a state being followed by itself. Okay, so transition probabilities talk about moving among these different features in the biological model. Emission probabilities relate to the sequences that result from a given state. There are a lot of different things that you might want to know about uh, hidden Markov models, and I wanted to make sure that we discussed three key algorithms that frequently show up in any paper relating to hidden Markov models. So the first of these is the Baum-Welch algorithm. Baum-Welch is hopefully not an algorithm you yourself are going to have to learn at some point, because if you are using an existing HMM uh, to make assessments of your sequence, somebody has already gone through Baum-Welch for you because the creation of a hidden Markov model requires a bunch of training sequences. Let's use the example of the transmembrane um, HMM that we looked at just a couple slides ago. In the transmembrane HMM, they had a bunch of biological sequences known to describe 
transmembrane channels for proteins. And in each of those cases, they uh, showed how the known sequences related to the transmembrane domain structure fed that to the software, and the software built an HMM from it. Now, they didn't have to write all of this anew. There, there are some very good libraries out there, like Hammer, for example, for learning how to create an HMM from a bunch of sequences and known annotation. In this case, Baum Welch results in an HMM given a bunch of training sequences and a, a model that's going to be used to describe them. Now, the forward-backward algorithm is one of these things that's going to take place when you, you have a, a sequence and you're asking, does it hit or not? So it is, it is possible that you would have a bit of genomic sequence and you feed it to a gene finder and there is no protein there, right? If there's no protein coding gene there, you should hit zero. You should have only low scores throughout the sequence. So in a case like that, the forward-backward algorithm has scored a, an unknown, the sequence you've provided, against the model and asked, does it match or not? So it, it could be that you have zero matches to say, for example, there are no protein coding genes in this genomic stretch, or it could be that you have one or more genes there. What if you have a very gene-rich region and you're able to find five different protein coding genes? That's highly likely, in, in some, it, depending on you know, how many megabases of sequence you're feeding it. So the forward-backwards uh, uh, algorithm is going to give us a score to say, is there a hit or not on the sequence? And finally, it's not enough to you simply to say that the algorithm says there's a gene here. That's great, but what you'd really like is to understand how this biological feature you've described in the HMM relates to the sequence you've observed. So you can think of the forward-backward algorithm as giving you a score to say, is there a hit or not? But when you dissect that hit, when you ask what parts of this gene structure map to the sequence that I've given, you would need the Viterbi algorithm. Viterbi is going to dissect that structure and say, this is the most likely path through this biological structure that this sequence represents. So you don't need, how to, you don't need to know how to code Baumwelch or Viterbi or forward-backward. Um, feel free to look into those and borrow a computer scientist to help you um, if you want to go that direction. But generally speaking, you should know what these three algorithms are designed to accomplish in uh, this biological context. That finally brings us to one of the first successful implementations of the hidden Markov model for protein coding gene finding. I'm showing you about half of gene scan. Uh, this is a hidden Markov model designed for the specific application of finding protein coding genes in eukaryotic DNA. So in this case, we start with the problem that it might be that you have a plus sense gene, which is to say that the, the top strand is the one that has the gene in correct order. But it might be a case that the gene structure is actually on the negative sense strand, that you're, as you tra traverse from left to right, you're seeing the the three prime end of the gene before you see the five prime end of the gene. So the structure needs to have a bit of symmetry to it, that we have the top half that's looking for genes in the top strand, and we have the bottom half, not shown here, that's looking for the genes in the opposite order. Okay, next up. It incorporates quite a few pieces to it, because it's trying to model transcriptional boundaries. Where do we start transcription? Where do we end transcription? Splicing boundaries which bits of exon get connected together to splice out introns, and translational signals. You know, where's the start codon? Where does the ribosome attach and begin uh, expressing the, the polypeptide? All of these things need to be incorporated in one model, which means it's going to be kind of, com kind of complex. Um, finally, it needs to be able to detect multiple genes in one stretch of DNA. If you're passing it megabases of assembly that have been produced from your uh, sequencer uh, assembly process, then you need to be able to detect multiple sites where protein coding genes may be detected there. So, handing, handing it a giant piece of DNA, the software needs to be able to say, all right, I think that's a promoter about there. Uh, this is the start of transcription. This is where the intron exon boundaries are. This is the start of translation. It's quite a lot. So imagine that you are passing a large piece of DNA to the software. You're going to start in this intergenic region down at the bottom. Likely, the first thing you're going to encounter will be a region of sequence with a bunch of T and A uh, nucleotides in it. And that 
is likely to say, ah, the probability that this sequence represents a promoter is much higher than that it represents an intergenic region. From there, we're going to see the five prime untranslated region, which is to say a part where transcription is happening, but translation does not happen. And you might have a very simple gene structure of a single exon. So you could pass from the five prime UTR to, the exon, uh, to a single exon, pass out to a three prime untranslated region, a polyadenylation site, which we frequently find at the three prime end of these genes, and then you're right back to the intergenic region. That's a simple gene, right? One exon. Of course, this being a eukaryotic uh, uh, gene finder, you're likely to have a much more complex relationship among these. Let's take the case of a two exon gene. That's a pretty simple one, right? So now we're going to start at the promoter, go through the five prime UTR. We're going to have an initial exon now, and now this exon is going to have to pass to one of three introns that, that are possible from there. After all, it might be that the, the first intron you experience comes at a codon boundary. In a case like that, you're at frame zero. It might be that it cuts off after the first nucleotide of a three-letter codon. In a case like that, you're in frame one. Or it might cut after, the, after two, uh, two nucleotides of a three-nucleotide codon, in which case you're in frame two. So from this initial exon, you pass to one of these introns. From that intron, you can then pass to another exon, and then, uh, sorry, we were just going to do two. So we're not going to move to any of these exons up here. We're going to go from the initial exon to an intron to a final exon, and then pass out through a three prime untranslated region, polyadenylation site, and come off to the intergenic region. This is a complex process. So, as I, as I said, I, I want you to know that hidden Markov models are one of the best ways for us to find genes, to um, create a set of putative genes for a novel sequence, and to dissect its structure so that we can say these are the, ex the exons that are most plausible for this gene structure, um, this is where their boundaries are, this is the part that would be spliced out to create them, and so on, the polyadenylation site, and get us back to an intergenic region. So we might ask, how well do these in silico models work? Um, for those who haven't heard the term in silico, uh, it, it's a bit of a joke off of things like in vitro. You know, when you're working in glassware, we say it's in vitro. But here we say in silico because frequently we're doing our experiments on computers, and they use silicon processors. So in silico. So how well do these in silico methods support gene finding? Well, we start with the idea that these are ab initio HMMs. These are we are, we are starting from a bulk sequence that's been assembled, and we don't know anything about it. So this is the ab initio case. We're starting from scratch to try to find the genes. They are prone to finding genes or for finding exons where there are none. You might remember um, it from our earlier discussions that there are lots of places in the genome that look like protein coding genes, but aren't. Because after all, we very frequently have pseudogenes and other things that creep in there uh, that, that have similar structures to genes, but they don't represent current genes. So ab initio HMMs can trigger on those things and say, well, now that looks an awful lot like a gene. If you haven't masked that stuff out, the software may say, well, it still looks like a gene to me. Okay, so that's one of the big problems, that having run an ab initio gene finder on a pile of DNA, you think there are more genes than there really are. Now, it is possible that we go looking for genes because we have seen many, many genes before. Let's imagine that you are sequencing a baboon. Baboons have been sequenced. But let's just say you're sequencing a baboon and you know nothing about its gene structure. Baboons are closely related to humans. So you could say, I know this gene exists in humans and it has a structure like this. You could then go searching by sequence homology to see if the baboon has a region like that. That's great. I mean, it's a very effective method. We call those similarity-based gene prediction tools. And some of those are very, very good. But imagine that you're trying to sequence a platypus. Is a human genome annotation very, very useful for determining the gene set of platypus? It's not the worst you could do. We've tried worse, but in general, the platypus and the human are pretty far apart at this point. 
Likewise, you, you wouldn't want to use um, something like uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, the, the watercress plant that we use as our model organism, to try to annotate the rice genome. They're really quite far apart. Arabidopsis and rice, they're not in the same ballpark. Yet they're both plants. Plants are very diverse. So, similarity-based gene prediction tools depend really strongly on your having a, a very similar gene annotation to draw from. Maybe you're working with house cats and uh, you're trying to see if the lion genome maps well to the cat genome. You could do stuff like that, but get much further than that and these things start to get a little messy. Some of the things that we can do when we have very closely related genomes is the use of syntony, which is to say that if you have gene A and gene C that have gene B in between them in human, and you have a hit on gene A and a hit on gene C in mouse, you could probably infer that this maybe hit in the middle is a hit for gene B, because the bit of DNA that has genes A, B, and C in human is very similar to the part that has genes A, B, and C in mouse. That relationship of which genes fall in what order on the piece of DNA is called syntony. That can also be used. And finally, we get down to the fact that we don't have to rely solely on software to accomplish this. Today, we're able to use RNA-seq in order to determine empirically what transcripts are produced from this genome. You don't have to rely on just annotating the genome and not having uh, the, the availability of, of transcript sequences because they're so easy to get now. So we see that there are a, a whole host of things that are evolving here that gene finding doesn't have to rely solely on informatics. I note that we are at our very first intermission of the day. We're going to cut this video into three parts because it's a long one, I know, and I want everybody to be nice and awake. So at this point, I want you to pause the YouTube video and take a little dance around your house, and then you can come back when you're good and fresh, okay? See you soon. And welcome back. I hope you had a really good jog um, and that you're fresh and ready to go because this second part of the lecture is going to be very, very important. Anyone who hears you've taken a bioinformatics class is going to assume you know something about sequence homology. Let us start with the fact that we often run into the problem that we have a gene of unknown function. Just because the hidden Markov model has found a bunch of introns and exons and promoters and so on does not mean that you know what that sequence does. If this is expressed, what kind of function is it likely to take on? Now there are three general thrusts that go with this. First off is, have I seen a similar sequence? It might be that you are working in horseshoe crabs, and if you're working in horseshoe crabs, there may not be a huge body of information of protein biochemists in army-sized strength all working on every last gene product to make sure we know what they are. But that doesn't mean you're going to be completely in the dark about what this novel sequence does, because if you have a gene that you've observed in horseshoe crab, you can compare it to sequences seen in other species. This is the sequence homology approach. This is going to be the emphasis for the second part of this talk. For that, we can talk about systems like BLAST and Interpro. Interpro is going to show up in the last part of our talk. BLAST is the sequence alignment algorithm that everyone seems to know about. So we'll be talking about that one in, in great strength. What genes are expressed similarly? That might seem like a very arcane question to ask about a novel gene, but in fact it's really important. Because if you see that these five genes are always up together and always down together under the same particular sets of circumstances, it may well be that they play a role in a common mechanism. So if we see that these five genes go up and down together and these three are all associated with a particular biochemical pathway, you might infer that these other two also take part in that pathway. Next, does my gene product collaborate? Collaboration is not just for professors, it is also for genes, because very frequently we see that the gene product from this gene over here and the gene product of that gene product over there form a complex, and that protein complex undergoes a process collectively. So for that, we would want to understand the protein-protein interactions of that gene, and we have a variety of different methods that we've used for that purpose. For now, let's just focus our goals on 
Have we seen a sequence like this one in the past? Sequence alignment is our way of detecting homology among sequences. So why would we go about doing this? Let's start with recognizing orthologs. Orthologs. Having newly sequenced an organism find genes that match those known uh, that matched known genes in other organisms. Did you know that you and a blade of grass have a lot in common? You do. We evolved on Earth. We have great similarity to the genes found in other species on Earth. It might seem that you and a blade of grass are so distantly related that you couldn't possibly say anything about one that relates to the other. This is not in fact true. Lots of our genes are highly similar across these relationships. That's because these genes have diverged from each other across species boundaries so that one gene has become, a, one ancestral gene has become a gene in humans and another gene in a blade of grass. Those are orthologs. Next, paralogs. Paralogs. We would like to recognize these because we want to determine whether a sequenced gene is part of a gene family within the species. This is a case where a uh, a particular gene, a region of your genome may be duplicated over time. Maybe one of your ancestors way back many millennia had a gene duplication event occur in which chromosome 16 gained a shadow copy, that there were two copies of chromosome 16, and that was preserved in the, the, uh, the, the, the descendants. In a case like that, every gene on chromosome 16 is going to be present in two copies. Generally those get scrubbed out. But in some cases, we find that these duplication events, particularly we get in, when we get into things like trees, they're ridiculous on this score, have many, many copies of the same genes. Okay, and finally, we want to, we want to recognize conserved regions. We use sequence homology to recognize that some parts of these genes stay very stable. They don't change at all. They don't get insertions. They don't get deletions. They don't even accumulate many mutations at all. They stay the same over long swaths of evolutionary time. That is almost always the case associated with a very strong um, specificity that this sequence and this sequence alone is capable of carrying out this particular function. So when we find conserved regions of sequences, we attribute to them the, uh, the, the notion of shared functionality that remains stable against evolutionary pressures. So from a very high level, we would talk about sequence homology engines using a variety of terms that I want everybody to understand for you know, quest, uh, assessments and things like that. So uh, from a very high level view, we're going to have a, a slight differentiation here between global and local alignment approaches. In a global alignment, we are comparing one whole sequence to another whole sequence. And we're trying to find the best way to align every feature in one sequence to the other. Frequently, we find that the homologies that we use now are, are built on this idea of local alignment which is to say that we might have a fragmentary sequence on the one hand and a complete sequence on the other, and we want to see where in this big sequence the short one best aligns. So in a case like that, a local alignment becomes possible. So global and local alignment represent these two extremes. Within this, we have kind of the optimal algorithms that produce a provably correct best match. This is a, an, an algorithm, we might say. And we have a heuristic approach that doesn't give us guaranteed the best match, but is very, very, very fast at giving us pretty good matches. So you might think of this as a, an algorithm versus heuristic, a, a provably correct versus very fast and somewhat sloppy, but very good answer. We find that, um, that heuristics in sequence search, in sequence homology, have gained a huge amount of say simply because um, doing a provably correct matching against a massive database of sequences can take so long to do. Even with computers getting better all the time, the number of new sequences we get in our databanks outstrip Moore's Law by a large fraction. Okay, so having a provably correct best answer versus a pretty good answer, but one you can get quickly, has frequently been won by the heuristic instead. Okay. And the other thing that we are going to talk about just briefly is the idea of gaps. 
you may occasionally see something like the term affine gap, uh, affine gap penalties, which represent a way that we punish the, uh, a, a sequence that has, has to have a big insertion thrown into it to make it match to a long sequence. So for this, an, an affine gap penalty refers to the fact that we give a penalty to score because we're going to introduce a gap in one sequence. But the affine gap penalty means that we're going to add to the cost of that penalty the bigger we make it. So introducing the gap in the first place has one penalty, making it bigger has a, a lesser penalty associated with it. I used to give a whole lecture on, on dynamic programming models of sequence alignment. I feel like that might be just a little bit too much. So we are not going to describe why dynamic programming is such a brilliant way to perform sequence alignments, but it is frequently a very big player in this score. Imagine that we have the sequence GCCCTAGCG on the one hand, and on the other hand we have the sequence G, C, G, C, A, A, T, G. You might think to yourself, okay, well, they're both comprised of G's, A's, C's, and T's, but how do they align to each other? We're going to use a really, really simple scoring model right now. We're going to say that if these sequences both have G at a position, that's a hit. If they both have A at a position, that's a hit. So identity scoring is going to be in effect to say if the sequence has the same letter at this position, that's a hit. Anything else we're going to call a miss. All right, so it's a very simple scoring system, but it's going to work for just this case. So we could imagine that the, both of these sequences start with GC, GC. So these are good hits, and we see that in this matrix below, we have little red circles to indicate that if these two are uh, aligned to each other, we're going to get a hit in score on both of those positions. The G lines up with G, that's plus one. The C lines up with C, that's plus one. But what happens when we get to the third letter? C versus G is not a hit. That doesn't contribute to score. When we get to the fourth letter, we have a C in both cases. Well, so we're back on again, right? So the first letter, the second letter, and the fourth letter are hits but the third letter is not. Things get a little messier, though, when we get to the, the back end of these sequences. We have an A and a G here, and they can be compelled to align with the A and the G in the other sequence, but they're out of step with each other. We need to introduce a gap that allows us to match this A and a G to this A and this G. So this process of, of finding the best way to gap one sequence versus the other to get an alignment that maximizes the matching between the two is actually a fairly complex problem, but one that can be solved in what we call a big O M N score uh, um, uh, algorithm efficiency, which is to say that we multiply the length of one sequence by the length of the other sequence, and that gives us an estimate of how long it takes to produce this alignment. So in a needleman wunsch local algorithm, uh, sorry, in a Smith-Waterman local algorithm, or the needleman wunsch global version of this algorithm, we're able to, to find the best way to stretch one sequence versus another to maximize these hits between them. That's the dynamic programming approach, and it produces provably the best match for a given scoring system. It is also, however, very slow. And this is a, a big problem. If you are trying to match one sequence that you've just, that you've just created um, from your sequencer, and you're trying to compare against millions or billions of sequences that exist in a database, you really need something that's much, much faster than that. So we're going to talk about how we get there. Let's talk about some of the differences that creep in when we move away from DNA or RNA sequences with just four letters to amino acid sequences that have 20 letters. We start with the fact that identity-based scoring is not very good when we move away from DNA. But even in the context of DNA, let's think about this. Before we were scoring perfect matches as a plus one, that if both sequences have a C, we call that a plus one. If, if one has a C and one has a G, that's not plus one. That's great, but in reality, when we look at comparisons between nucleotide sequences, some kinds of changes are more likely than others. So you remember, I think, that nucleic acid sequences are comprised of purines and pyrimidines. Remember, the, the long name, pyrimidines, relates to the smaller molecule, in this case, C or T, whereas 
pure, uh, purines are the, uh, the larger ones, G and A. So, uh, so in this case, we have the, the substitution of one uh, purine for another purine, or one pur uh, pyrimidine for another pyrimidine is called a transition. Those are relatively likely in the, in the uh, genome evolution scope. Transversions, on the other hand, substitute a purine for a pyrimidine, or a pyrimidine for a purine. That is a less likely scenario in the context of genome evolution. So it might make better sense for us to score a perfect match and a transition and a transversion at different levels, rather than simply saying it is a match or it isn't a match. So we can already start making our system a lot more complex just from a DNA matching perspective. When we get to amino acid sequences, we always need to use something that tells us whether the substitution of one amino acid for another is, is acceptable through substitution matrices. And substitution matrices can be derived a variety of ways. Today I'm going to talk about the one behind Blossom62, one of the most widely used substitution matrices out there. So for this, Blossom62 serves as our scorecard to say, in this case, this sequence has replaced a G with an A. Is that acceptable? A glycine for an alanine. This system allows us to, to, to evaluate from an empirical basis what the replacement of one amino acid with another, is, whether it's acceptable or not. Okay. The other thing I want to talk about is scope. If you are comparing uh, the sequence changes that we see in human versus those in a bonobo, these are really, really similar species. Humans and bonobos are really, really close. I mean, we're, we only diverge from each other in the last, say, 10 million years. I'm, I'm probably off by an order of magnitude, but not a long time in evolutionary scale. So in something like that, working with DNA sequence is actually quite necessary to find differences between the sequences of a bonobo and a human. We're very closely related. Chimpanzees, again, very closely related. So for something like that, using DNA is appropriate. But what if you're looking for evolutionary relationships between human genes and blades of grass? Well, in a scenario like that, you're looking at a much, much longer evolutionary distance. For something like that, it's probably appropriate to step away from nucleotide sequences and use protein sequences instead as your yardstick. Now, I'm going to talk, a, a very briefly at least, about position-specific scoring matrices. You're lucky that in this lecture we've already talked about hidden Markov models. These are much simpler to work with. In this case, each column is going to be a different biological state, and that biological state is going to say, what do I predict the sequence, at, the sequence that the letter present at this position would be? So we're going to, uh, the position-specific scoring matrix is to say, for each letter of the sequence, what output, uh, what emission probabilities are associated with each. The transition probabilities are going to be very boring. They're going to go from position 0 to position 1 to position 2 to position 3, etc. Okay, each row of the position-specific scoring matrix is going to represent a different letter that has been seen there. So it's, it's very much like the hidden Markov model, but with a much simpler structure to it. So here we are looking at a, um, a, a conserved domain that's reported over at the, C, the CD database at NCBI. We're looking at a, uh, something called a leucine zipper. This is a type of sequence that is related to a particular fold that's very, very good for interacting with DNA. So like if a, if a protein needs to interact with DNA in this way, a leucine zipper is one of the most common ways that that happens. Well, there are lots of them. I should not express that there are a pile of them. Okay, so we have these different sequences then that have been observed to contain leucine zippers. And as we look across these sequences, you should notice quite a few of these sites have conserved sequence. So just to choose one uh, more or less at random, we see that this has an A, that has an A, that has an A, that has an E, that has an A, that has a G, that has an H, that has a Y, that has an A, that has a T. There's some diversity there in what sequence is there, but A was the most common letter to be found at that position. When you look at things like these, you see that we have a very, very high degree of conservation. These particular columns, represent areas within the sequence signature that are highly invariant. 
They're not perfectly conserved. Here we see KKMVRKKKKK. Lysine, the letter K, is clearly the most common amino acid at that position. Um, when we come over here, we see that R, 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 it's perfectly conserved. There's no example in this, in this possum where R doesn't appear at that position. That is strongly conserved. When we have something like this, we're seeing many sequences that share this common sequence motif. And that motif is going to guide us in, uh, in whether another sequence matches to this or not. Now, I'm, I want to look very closely at this conserved block of sequence. The, uh, the blocks database was created by Hennikoff and Hennikoff uh, back in the about the time I was entering grad school, actually, and they, uh, I, I was very fortunate to have, the Hen have Steve Hennikoff come to my class and explain the Blocks database to me. I had no idea he was going to be ridiculously famous at this point in time. I just knew that this guy was really, really enthusiastic about conserved domains of sequence. If you got to learn from the best, hey, go with it, right? So, here we see that these sequences have all been aligned versus each other. These are a C5 cytosine-specific DNA methylase, but you could choose any number of domains to, to work with. The BLOCKS database was designed to recognize ungapped alignments where there's a high degree of sequence conservation. We see that some of these sequences have differences in how many letters appear to the N-terminal end of this sequence. This one doesn't have any amino acids between this position and this position. This one has two amino acids jammed in there. This one has two. This one has three. Those represent gaps in the alignment. And their feeling was, if you got to deal with gaps, go work in another lab. They didn't like gaps. So the BLOCKS database focuses on these regions that have no gaps whatsoever, and they align really strongly among multiple sequences. Let's look at just one position here. I've drawn a box. We see that this position within the block has G, C, S, S, G, S, G, 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 G. Now I think everyone gets that there is some diversity at this site. It's not a huge amount of diversity. G is very clearly one of the most common results. So we can, we can just count. How popular is each letter at this position? G, 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 G. That's six. Six glycines. C. Just once. So one cysteine appears here. S, S, S. Three. We have three serines here. So we can, as we, if we are trying to determine whether a new sequence is like this, we can ask which of the letters is, is found at this particular position. If it's not a G, S, or C, it's not going to score well. If it is a G, S, or C, that's great. Let's now think about this as an evolutionary problem. Mutation is always throwing up new letters that might be found at a particular position, and selection, natural selection, is allowing some of those to get by and not allowing others to get by. So let's imagine that each of these different sequences then represents a different acceptable evolutionary outcome. We can then say, if we compare these first two sequences, one DCT underscore A and P25265, we can see that G and C are, uh, are replacements for each other. If G was the ancestral sequence, it is acceptable for it to be replaced with a C. If C was the ancestral sequence, then G is an acceptable replacement for it. And we don't have snapshots of what the ancestral sequence looked like. We just have a bunch, of, a bunch of creatures running around today that we can guess from. So we could think then of G being replaced by C. We could think of G being replaced by S. We could think of C being replaced with G. We could think of C being replaced with S. We could think of S being replaced by G or S being replaced by C. All three of those letters could be replaced by any one of the other two in that case. So we think of this not just as an alignment of this is what we see today, but also as our trace of what may have happened over evolution. So we see this as G could be replaced by C one time, G could be replaced by S 
three times. And this one's going to seem a little weird. G could be replaced by G, yes, that's how we think about it, five times out of that. So we, we can create a matrix out of each position, out of each block. And that is the heart of the Blossom algorithm. For those who felt that entering biology meant there was going to be no math, I'm going to have just a little disappointment for you. We're going to have a little math. So we're going to start with the fact that we need to be able to compare low probabilities to each other. Um, you, you could ask, for example, what is the probability that I, a South African, could be struck by lightning and, and killed, right? So there are 55 million people in South Africa. Uh, how many people in South Africa are killed by lightning each year? I'm not actually sure. Let's say it's 10. It's 10 high or low. Oh, I'm hearing 10 is low. Let us say it's 100 people in South Africa die of lightning strikes in a given year. All right, so that's going to be, uh, we could compute the probability that any South African would be killed by lightning in a year as 10 divided by 55 million, or sorry, 100 divided by 55 million. All right, um, what number of people in South Africa die each year in a car accident? Is it higher or lower than 100? Ah, camera person says higher. <laughs> I'm going to agree. Let us say that 20,000. Should we make it higher? 55,000? You want to go lower. 5,500? We'll go 5,500. Okay, so if... I think it's much higher than 5,500 yeah. people. Okay, let's go higher. 55,000. So if 55,000 people in South Africa die in car accidents every year, we can divide that by 55 million people and say there's a one in a thousand chance that an, an individual drawn at random would die in a car accident each year. So you might ask, should I be terrified of dying in a lightning strike or should I be terrified of dying in a car accident? And one way that we would answer that is to divide the probability of dying in a lightning strike by the probability of dying in a car accident. This would be called a log odds ratio, a probability divided by another probability. Odds are neither of these is going to kill us this year. But, hey, throw together 55 million people and give them those odds, yeah, people are going to die from one or the other of these things. Right, so these two probabilities can then be combined. And in the same way, we're going to be able to compare the probability that one amino acid gets replaced by another amino acid in these conserved domains. The, same, the math is the same. We have a probability that a given letter would be replaced by another letter. We have, um, in, in the case of a G being replaced by a G, that's a very high probability. If a G gets replaced by a C in that previous example, it's a much lower probability. We can compare those by asking how common is G in a sequence database. Well, the answer is quite, probable, uh, quite, uh, quite popular. Glycine is a very small amino acid, and it shows up all the time in protein sequences. What about cysteine, though? Is cysteine popular in protein sequences? No, it's actually one of the three least commonly seen amino acids. Cysteine, tryptophan, and methionine are all quite rare by comparison. So to replace glycine with cysteine would seem like a very unlikely event. Right. So we can compare the number of times we empirically observe that C replaces G versus the number of the, the, the percentage of all uh, letters that glycine represents and of all letters that cysteine represents and ask if the product of those two uh, proportions is the same as or different than what we observed to take place. So we, it's, there are lots of times when the uh, the probability of one is very different than the probability of the other, which makes it really important that we look at these ratios not just on a number, an A divided by B scale, a linear scale, but rather to look at them on a log scale, a log scale. So in a log scale, you're dividing one probability by the other, you're taking the log of that value. If it's positive, it's saying that this is happening much more than you would expect by random chance. If it's negative, you're saying, this happens much less than I would expect by random chance. And if it's zero, that's to say, well, it happens just as much as you would expect by random chance. 
How does that play out? So we see that Blossom 62 is not considering just one position in one block. It's treating all positions in all blocks and putting all of those data together in one substitution matrix. We see, for example, that cysteine being replaced by cysteine is strongly favored. On a log base 2 scale, it gets a score of 9, which is to say that 2 raised to the ninth power, which if I remember correctly is 512, 512 times more likely than, uh, than, by, uh, than you would expect by random chance to see that cysteine remains cysteine. Now why would that be? Cysteine, I think we all remember, plays a very special role in protein structure. That when you have a cysteine at a particular location, it can create a, di a disulfhydryl bond with another cysteine to create kind of a safety pin holding that protein structure in place. What would happen biologically if you replaced a cysteine engaged in a disulfide bond with something other than cysteine? Well, that safety pin can't form anymore. So, replacing cysteine with cysteine is really the only acceptable outcome for many of these um, cysteine residues. So, C remaining C is the most likely outcome. Likewise, tryptophan remaining tryptophan is very likely. Remember, tryptophan is one of these very rare amino acids. Well, tryptophan does its own specific biochemistry, and replacing it with another amino acid is not really favorable. So, on this diagonal, we see a whole bunch of very high values, which is to say that some of these amino acids are really strongly preferred to remain that and only that amino acid. As we look off of the diagonal, though, we begin looking at true replacements. So we might consider something like leucine and valine. Here's valine, here's leucine. So if we drop all the way down that column, we see a 1. That 1 is to tell us that 2 to the first power, 2 in this case, is how much more often leucine and valine replaced each other than you would have expected by random chance. Okay, so what we see then is that these replacements can be evaluated by how much they actually take place in empirically observed um, assemblies versus what you'd expect by random chance. If you see a positive value here, it's to say that evolution is generally more favorably inclined towards that replacement than you would expect by random chance alone. So if you were to look at this 3, for example, you would see that phenylalanine is quite happy to be replaced in many cases by tyrosine. They're both large amino acids, and, and those side chains have very similar kinds of biochemistry. So you can use this guide as a way to say which amino acid can replace another. Now how does that play out when we look at a sequence alignment? Let us imagine that someone has given us this REG sequence at the top and given us the YDG sequence at the bottom. They've said this is how these two align to each other. We see that in each case a particular letter is aligned with another letter in the other case. We have no gaps to worry about. We just have this sequence lined out against that sequence. How do we score it? We would start with each position getting evaluated independently. R versus Y. Arginine and tyrosine. Is it okay or not okay to replace those? So we start with the R column right here and run down to Y, which is down here next to the bottom of the screen. It scores a minus 2. We now write our minus 2 in here. E versus D. How do you feel about that one? Good or bad? Aspartic acid, D, and glutamic acid, E, have very similar biochemistries. So, you might expect that they have a positive score, and indeed they do. When we look at Blossom uh, 62, we see that D versus E scores favorably. It gets a plus 2. So, for each of these amino acid versus amino acid combinations, we can look up the score, we write them into this middle row, and at the end we just add it up. We just add it up. The score for this sequence aligned by that sequence on Blossom 62 is the sum of the lookup values that we get for each pair of amino acids. That's how Blossom 62 very frequently gets employed. And with that, we come to the end of our discussion of substitution matrices. When we come back, after a quick run around the house, we're going to have a little discussion about how this gets embodied in algorithms like BLAST and Clustal W. And welcome back.
We are coming into the closing stretch. Having learned about substitution matrices, we are ready to learn how sequence alignment algorithms like BLAST and W function. Let's start with BLAST. It's the killer app. It's the tool that made everybody say, you know, bioinformatics is really a discipline of its own. BLAST is a very, very big deal. How do you BLAST something against an, a whole sequence database? You have a, a new sequence and you want to evaluate which sequence in all of the database is a good hit to it. BLAST is, a, is the attempt to answer that. They made a, a little bit of a shortcut here, and this is one of the reasons why we describe BLAST as a heuristic, not an optimal, guaranteed, best match scoring approach. Their idea was that if you have two sequences that are homologous to each other, it stands to reason that they will share some very short stretches inside them that are identical to each other. This is a gamble, right? To say that two sequences that are similar will in some place be identical to each other. But that's exactly what BLAST requires. It expects a seed match, which is to say a short stretch of three amino acids that is identical between these two sequences that are similar to each other. Seed match. Alright, so it's going to use something called a finite state machine that we're going to talk about in just a minute to say what sequences in the database match to these seed matches perfectly. Alright, from these seed matches we are then going to ask how much can we extend out from these regions of identity to create a maximal segment pair, a part that, uh, that says basically this whole region bears similarity between these two sequences. So, having started from seed matches and built out to a maximal segment pair, we need to be able to produce some score that says, how good a hit is this? Alright, so we're going to sort all of the maximal segment pairs that we produce from a, a database search um, by the alignment score that results from them, and we're going to display those that are unlikely to be hits by random chance. That's kind of an odd way to express it, isn't it? It's possible that if I just have a few million sequences in a database and I give it a sequence, let's say my name, David, I can search this database of protein sequences to say, have I got a match to, this, to the letters D-A-V-I-D? -D. You know, somewhere in a million sequences, that's going to hit. But we need to be able to, dis to discriminate between randomly, uh, uh, randomly produced hits and unlikely uh, hits by random chance alone. Okay, so one of the key things that, that transformed BLAST into the killer app that everybody used was the ability to express its alignment scores not just as sums off of a Blossom 62 table, but to be able to assess them statistically to say that if you did this search, um, you would have expected this, uh, 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 the best score that resulted to be this good or better by random chance five times, or one in a thousand times, right? That's what the expectation value gives us. The number of alignments with scores at least this good that were expected to have resulted by random chance. Those are the Carlin Altschul statistics. So the initial algorithm by Altschul et al., published in 1990, provided a very rapid way to search very large databases for hits, and the Carlin Altschul statistics gave us an ability to estimate how likely this chance would be by random chance alone. So let's talk about how this software works. So a finite state machine is actually a fairly advanced concept, um, something that shows up when you're working on a major in computer science, but in this case we are asking um, for a query sequence that looks like this, what is our best hit, right? So, oh, I'm sorry, I've got this backwards. This is our sequence that we're trying to hit against, and this is our query. So we've entered in KSS, GSS, YPS, and we're asking what are the hits within a larger sequence. Remember that our requirement here is not homology. It's not allowing for approximately similar sequences. It's asking for exact matches. And we have to have three letters in a row that we call a really good, that we call identical between this sequence and this down here. So what we've done, and this may seem a little counterintuitive, but I'm going to try to explain it, is that we're going to digest up this sequence into every three-letter combination that appears. 
we have KSS, that's our first one, SSG, that's our second one, we have SGS, that's our third one, we have GSS, that's our fourth. So we're taking every set of three consecutive letters from this query sequence. This data structure represents all of them. We see that KSS is represented by a descent to the K here, to an S after that, and to an S after that. SSG is represented here. S, S, G. You see that? So every traversal from the top of this to the bottom of this tree is a, another three-letter combination that we find when we disintegrate this into three-letter strips. So SYP, for example, the next to last one, is represented by S to Y to P. Now we're going to use this, this uh, Ahokarasic dictionary algorithm to ask what three-letter combinations here, represented by this data structure, are matched exactly in here. So I'm going to note that we're going to have three pointers moving around this structure at the same time. Every time they're going to start at this top of the tree. So our first pointer is going to ask, is there a T to which I can descend? Because T is the first letter of the sequence we're, we're searching. Can I go to T, 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 T? I can't. So this pointer just falls off. It's gone for a while. Um, there's no T for us, uh, no T that starts a three-letter combination here, so that pointer just falls away. Now our next pointer starts at the root on, this, uh, on the second pass. So L is the first letter that we hit. Can I descend to an L? I cannot. There's no L. So that one goes away for a while. In fact, none of these first four letters in this sequence are hits to this at all. But, what happens when we hit a Y? When I have a Y, I can descend to the next row because Y is one of the first three letters that appear in a, a sequence here. We move on to the next one though, N. Can, the, can I descend to an N from this Y? I can't. So, we see then that as we start each pathway, um, as, we, as we reach each letter here, there's only one combination where we're going to be able to descend all the way to the bottom of that tree, and that appears in this yellow sequence. See, this pointer starts at the top on S, and it says, ah, I can move down to an S. That's okay. That's a win. The next letter is G. Can I descend to a G from this S? I can. It's right here. And then the next letter, S, we hit pay dirt. See, you only have a big winner if you have the ability to descend all the way from the top of this data structure to the bottom, because that's what reflects a three-letter hit between the sequence you're searching and the query that you started with. So every time we make it all the way to the bottom of this tree, we write it down as, a, as another seed match found between our query sequence and a database entry. That's how we determine in one pass through the database all hits of three letters between our query sequence and a database entry. It's a very fast algorithm for doing this, and because we can do this process efficiently, we can much more rapidly get to these matches between our query sequence and a database entry. Okay, so that's a start. We now have regions that are perfectly conserved between our query sequence and the one that we found in the database. It's not enough in BLAST to have shared regions of three identical peptides. We need to be able to expand out from that to take in regions of homology near these regions of identity. I hope everyone has those two concepts separate in their minds. Identity means the letters are the same between the two. Homology means that the letters are similar between the two. How do we decide what is similar? You just saw it. Blossom62 is going to help us to say, ah, replacing an L with a V, that's okay. Replacing a serine with a threonine, that's pretty much okay. These are the things that we look for to say that a replacement is more likely than you would expect by random chance in random sequences. Okay, so we now have a seed hit for RPE between the top sequence and the bottom sequence. We have a seed hit for MCT between the top sequence and the bottom sequence. But what about these other letters? Can we extend into those? Some of them are identical. We see that N versus N 
is identical. We see that F versus F, that's identical. We also see that some of these letter pairs have positive scores in the blossom matrix. A versus V, that's pretty good. E versus D, well, that's glutamic versus aspartic acid. They're very similar. That's a positive score. A versus V, we already said, was a, a good thing. So what we want to do then is expand out from these seed regions to take in acceptable um, amino acid replacements to try to produce the best scoring alignment we can between these two. MCT all by itself is a good score, but it's not as good a score as if you can build out further. So the, if the first stage of BLAST is to say, are there regions of identity between um, my query sequence and a database hit? In this case, we now want to build out from these regions of identity to take in other things that can contribute to the score without even being identical. In this case, our maximal segment pair is able to build beyond those seed hits to create an even more positive score by taking in regions of homology around it. In the end, what do you get from BLAST? A, a BLAST search is going to look across a database of thousands or millions even of, of sequences. In this case, I'm using a query that was built from a transcript that I had derived um, through an experiment uh, here in Cape Town for hyena. We were looking at transcripts made for hyena. So having searched a database, in this case Uniprot Knowledge Base, with, our, uh, with the BLASTX algorithm, I had given a messenger RNA sequence and told it to align to protein. And that might seem very squirrely and weird to do, but you can in fact do that because we are able to discern what amino acid sequence is equivalent to a, uh, a messenger RNA sequence through six-frame translation. So having generated a protein-to-protein -protein, uh, comparison by starting from messenger RNA, we were able to get all of these different hits uh, back. In this case, we were able to discern that the messenger RNA sequence we had from hyena is very similar to the interferon gamma sequences seen in a variety of other species. So you might ask yourself, well, what is a hyena most similar to? A lot of people, you'll find, say that a hyena must be some kind of dog. In fact, that's, that information is very wrong. When we look at the hits that we get back from BLASTX, in this case, we see that the taxonomies that are represented by these proteins are Felca, which is the house cat, ACGB, which is the cheetah, Limpa, which represents the lynx, and Panta, which is the same thing as tiger, which is to say that the interferon gamma sequence from hyena is much more similar to the interferon gamma sequence observed in other cats, not dogs. Okay. The other thing I want to point out is that we are able to evaluate whether these hits are likely to have occurred by random chance or not by the E values that show up for each of these. You're always going to find these E values reported in the output from BLAST. And what they let you estimate is how likely is it that you would have this match occur by random chance alone uh, in doing this database search. In this case, the values are all below 10 to the negative 97th power, which is to say as close to zero as, as matters. So essentially, the software is telling me this ain't a random hit, which is good news. If that score were one, on the other hand, we would disregard it as, as a completely random hit. In this case, in the case of BLAST, we've been talking about the search of one sequence against a database. We want to discern all of the hits in the database that have similar sequences to the one that we've supplied. In the case of multiple sequence alignment, we're getting rid of the database and instead saying, we have a, a set of multiple sequences and we want to discern which of them are most closely related to the others. What are the areas of relationship among these sequences? So multiple sequence alignment gives us that ability. So BLAST is great when you're trying to do a point-to-point -point comparison. You're just trying to ask, is this sequence like this other one? But in, in this case, we want to evaluate relationships within a set that we supply, uh, not looking at a database or having just one query anymore. So when these sequences are 
uh, most similar to each other, we, we begin to say that the evolutionary relationship between them implies that these have shared evolutionary history, that the, the more closely they appear in the multiple, multiple sequence alignment, the greater their evolutionary similarity, or the more recent their most common ancestor, a recent, uh, their most, <laughs> most recent common ancestor. So multiple sequence alignment helps us to learn which of, the, which of the amino acid residues in these sequences are most conserved over evolutionary time as well. Because it may be that some parts of the, the protein sequence change very rapidly, um, allowing that protein to take on a new role in the, in the organism, whereas others stay very much the same because they represent critical uh, abilities that are not um, amenable to tinkering, basically, by, select, uh, by mutation. So I've given a couple of examples here to illustrate the, the value of multiple sequence alignment in evaluating orthology and evaluating it in paralogy. Remember that orthology is what happens when you have a common ancestor that had one gene, and over time evolutionary, evolution has pushed uh, some of the organisms down one speciation path and others down another speciation path. And now we have two organisms that shared a common ancestor back when. So the, the single gene that appeared in the old species may have changed over time, but is still contained in the two species that came out of the common ancestor. In this case, I am using uh, a gene called pyruvate kinase. Now pyruvate kinase is a really, really important gene, and we've, we've had it since we were single cells, frankly. So in this case, I've looked at the pyruvate kinase sequence that appears in Arabidopsis thaliana, which is one of our most common model organisms in plants, yeast, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Droma, which here means Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, human, obviously the one from us, mouse, the one from Mus musculus, and uh, from E. coli, which is our most uh, widely studied model organism for bacteria, and Mycobacterium tuberculosis, here called MIC2. These are the abbreviations that's, that Uniprot uses for each of these species names. I've asked the software to give me back sequences that correspond to enzyme commission number 27140. This is the, the naming convention used to name this particular enzyme across many, many species. When we look at these sequences from all these different, uh, from all these different organisms, we find that all of them share very highly this, this region of conserved residues um, towards this end of the protein. We see that some of them are identical. For example, this blue position right here shows us that all of these amino acids, uh, that all of these sequences contain aspartic acid at this position. Some of them are similar, like this red column right here has valine, 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 leucine, valine. Now the software notes that these are different, but L versus V is a pretty good um, uh, has a pretty good Blossom 62 score. So the software is able to put uh, something less than a star, but not just leaving it blank. It recognizes this is a site where homology exists among these sequences. Is that to say these sequences are identical? Certainly not. Um, there, are, there are some positions, such as this one, where we have a, a glycine mixed in with a proline, a, a bunch of prolines. That's not a very highly conserved kind of relationship. Um, and in some cases, we have, say, G's, V's, and A's all at a position. But it's quite clear when we look at these sequences that there's a high degree of homology that exists among them. This is a highly conserved area. These reflect that these orthologs all have a common ancestor and that the sequence of that ancestor has, uh, has, has been borne out uh, it, through similar sequences across vast swaths of evolutionary time. This part of the protein is not one where you can tinker a lot and have it continue to play its proper role. And given that it's an energy metabolism, obviously it's, it's something that we've got to have working to continue living. Now the paralog case is quite different. The, uh, in this case, we're not asking about the relationship across species. We're looking at multiple copies of a given gene in one organism. Now, I have included an outgroup here. So, um, way back when, there was a, a homeobox protein, ABDB, that existed in one copy in eukaryotes. In this case, 
Arabidopsis, thal uh, sorry, not Arabidopsis, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, still has just one copy of that gene. So if we look for homeobox protein ABDB, we will find one gene within uh, the, the Drosophila melanogaster. When you look in a human database, though, you will find that there are four different sequences. This reflects the fact that we've twice over had gene duplication events on these stretches, and now we find that these homeobox proteins in humans are present in four copies. And they've all drifted apart over time to take on different roles in development, which is what these, these genes are known for. So what we see is that there are some regions of these proteins that are very highly conserved. Look at this run of stars over here. Perfect homology, perfect identity, in fact, from this point to this one. There are some places that are different, but it's quite clear that this lower part of sequence is hugely homologous among these sequences, even though insects and humans, despite what you'll say about our behavior, are quite similar on the sequence level. But look at this top part. These are the same proteins, just the preceding gene region. We see that this area is inserted in homeobox uh, D9 for humans. It has this long sequence that's been added in. It's a huge insertion that doesn't appear in any of the other, uh, any of the other genes. So we see one of the things that we just know to be true now for paralogs, which is to say that when gene duplications occur, the different members of the club take on different roles or they tend to be deleted. So we had four copies that resulted of this gene. They each took on a new role within the developing organism. And now humans always will have four homeobox, uh, D, sorry, homeobox 9 proteins, whether they're A9, B9, C9, or D9. I want to talk briefly about the, why we get so hung up about sequence homology. Sequence homology is our way of recognizing that two different sequences play similar roles. But there's a bit of an, ex an, an extrapolation that we're making there, and I want to try to walk through it a little bit. Sequences may be similar. And if sequences are similar, we tend to imply that the structure adopted is similar. That is a bit of a weak assumption, but generally speaking, if we have a sequence motif that is conserved, we expect a structural relationship on top of that. If we have a structure relationship that is maintained across species, or across different genes for that matter, um, we hope that the function that they take on will also be similar. It is possible through mutation that sequences that started out having, ver uh, having, having one sequence and one structure and one function diverge from each other, that changes in sequence lead to changes in structure, lead to changes in function, like the homeobox proteins that we just talked about. So this dogma that we talk about and we're all very accustomed now, I think, to thinking about replication and transcription and translation as the central dogma of molecular biology. But I would ask you to think a little bit about the central dogma of structural biology, that things with the same sequence tend to take on the same folds or the same structures. They tend to take on similar functions. All right. So that is uh, a, a way to spill that out. But we can think about this on many different levels. We might think about a sequence motif of just a few amino acids that may be part of a particular uh, domain that folds up independently, that has a known structure. But you, it may be that you have a, a family of proteins in which these are found. That's thinking about it on a rather different level. So when we, when we use these sequence homologies to attribute the same, uh, relationships in function, we always have to remember that there's a, a bit of a link that we have to, to keep in place. The, the sequence similarity may mean similar structure, which may mean similar function. Interpro is one of these really valuable sites that we can use to try to attribute these similarities in sequence to function. Um, and it's one that a, a South African actually had a very big role in creating. So if you ever visit the CBIO group over at UCT, you're visiting one of the people who helped originate the Interpro software. So there are uh, software um, patterns called regexes that are very familiar to people who work in uh, the Unix workspace. Uh, 
uh, regular expressions that give us the ability to recognize sequence similarities. We've already talked about possums, position-specific position um, sequence, uh, <laughs> sequence matrices, uh, and we have clustering approaches that may be used for recognizing sequence relationships, and certainly hidden Markov models are not just useful in the context of protein uh, coding genes, they may also be used to recognize sequence structures that exist in databases. All of these are something that you can access through the Interpro user interface. So I'm going to give just one brief example from this, um, and it's for a protein that uh, I actually have a weird relationship to. Back, back when I was in the States, I took part in trials uh, to uh, evaluate whether the FBI had proved its case that somebody was making ricin, a, a, a protein that can be used to hurt a lot of people, actually. Ricin is a devilish little protein, and this report tells the story of how it does its badness. So we note that there is a, uh, a region on the outside called a lectin, a lectin domain in this case. A lectin is a way that a protein interacts with a sugar. Lots of our cells announce their identity to each other by what sugars they show on the outside of the cells. So in this case, when ricin appears at a cell, it interacts with a sugar on the surface, which causes it to be allowed into the cell. So this lectin is kind of its door knocker. Hi, it's me, just your harmless ricin molecule. Please let me in. All right, at the other end, we have a ribosome inactivating protein, subdomain one and two. So the C-terminus of this protein is used to gain access to cells. The N-terminus of this protein is used to inactivate ribosomes. Now, you don't have to know a whole lot about biology to know that if you can't translate, if you can't produce proteins as a cell, your days are numbered. So we call this ribosome inactivating protein, and you have to think that the, uh, the people who developed that name had a bit of a sense of humor because it stands for RIP, which is to say it's the part that kills cells. So this uh, lectin allows the protein into cells. The RIP kills it. This is uh, the nature of the different kinds of domain hits that we're going to get back then from, uh, from Interpro. Some of these are going to be um, from... Uh, gene 3D, for example, which means that they are structural signatures saying that we recognize how this folds. Others are going to be things from, say, PFAM that represent um, matches to sequence motifs, etc. Some of them are from a, a very large scale, like superfamily, SSF, for example, to say that we recognize that this family of proteins is known across species. But all of this information is able to come back by just supplying the sequence and recognizing hits to uh, sequence motifs on a very small scale or on a very large scale. We have covered a lot of ground, and thank you very much for hanging in here to, here to the very end. There are a lot of takeaway messages to get from this lecture, and I'm going to try to tease those apart if I can. We start with hidden Markov models. Hidden Markov models remain one of our strongest ways to start with a large contig of sequence that we've derived from sequencing data and discern where the protein coding genes lie within it. So HMMs show up there. In the latter part of this lecture, we saw that HMMs can also be used to recognize smaller sequence motifs that take on a variety of functions within proteins. Aligning sequences has long stood as the killer app of bioinformatics. There are a lot of people who insist you must not be doing bioinformatics if you're not doing sequence homology searching. Well, for some people that's, that's true, for some people it's not. So we see that, that the ability to use BLAST critically, to be able to understand how it's going about making these hits, can lead to your making better decisions about whether something is a real hit or an incredible one, literally. Okay, sequence similarity often implies an evolutionary relationship. If you find that two sequences are similar to each other, it's likely that they share a common ancestor. It often implies that you have a related structure that, unfolds from, or that, that evolves from that, and thus that they play the same function. This is the central dogma of structural biology, and I hope that an understanding a little bit about this, uh, uh, the interplay of orthology, where we have the same gene in different species, and paralogy, where we have gene families that have duplicated out of a single ancestor gene, um, that, that both of these are 
something that we can detect very sensitively now through sequence homology. And with that, we're all finished with the day. Thank you very much. I hope that from this lecture, you are better positioned to interpret the results from sequence homology and gene finding. See you soon.